Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna run through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. Uh, I'll interject my financial opinions as we go through it, generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and or financial topics. Uh, so let's dive in there, let's take a look, see what people are sharing. If you wanna follow me at Finding Your Score Finance on Twitter, and if you wanna join our community, finding-value.com, uh, we've got a Question and answer session occurring today at 7 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, if you're interested, jump on the call. I'd be glad to answer any of your guys' questions. And we will be talking about uh, this yield curve <clears throat> potentially uninverting. What do the lowering of rates mean of the Federal Reserve? Uh, and then the assets that do well under this time uh, period or cycle. So Callum Thomas, he says, Newton's nightmare. Print this one and pin it to your wall. Uh, bubbles are constant. It's important lessons from history and because human nature is a constant. Um, I hate to admit it, guys, but the last bull market, uh, I got tossed out just like Newton did. I did the same thing. Um, so what, what occurred here is this is the South Sea stock. December 718 to December 721, and this is Isaac Newton's nightmare, is what they called it. So we had a big move higher, <clears throat> basically a breakout of the base. This is where Newton invests a little bit. We had a huge run higher, and trust me, guys, I, I see it on Twitter. I see it everywhere. Everybody gets so emotional. They get so excited. Uh, Newton exits his position. He exits happy here. So he made a bunch of money. But look what came after this big move. So <clears throat> Newton's friends got rich. Newton re-enters with a lot of money much higher than his buddies because uh, you can't see your buddies get rich. The stock market peaks and then he exits toward the bottom after it deflates. So how can one benefit from this spike and how can one get out of it? Uh, this here is a literal spike. It was probably just a bubble stock. Uh, but what I'll say is there are tools that you can use to prevent yourself from doing this. You also have to work on some of your emotions. Your entry points are going to be pretty, pretty bare because nobody cares about the stock. Uh, you're going to be going against the grain. And when you sell, you need a way to identify when something is expensive. And just because something is expensive doesn't mean it can't continue to go higher. It just means that your risk reward is going down. <clears throat> your risk is increasing. Your reward is declining. So as you go up, your risk increases and your rewards go down as you go up and up and up and up and up. Uh, the difficult part is, if you're in a company with massive growth, it's really hard to figure out when to sell uh, because they can grow quite a bit if you got in early. Commodity stocks, I think, are a little bit easier to see because you're gonna get increased inventories, your ratios are gonna get to an expensive state, uh, and then you usually go into an overproduction cycle. And you can see that, you can measure that. Um, so yeah, this is a lesson from Newton. I'm not stating that I would have done any better or any worse <laughs> than Newton did, because I, I don't know the South Sea stock. I didn't study 1718 to 1721. I didn't go that far back. But yeah, this happens to a lot of people. And a lot of it is emotional driven, emotion driven. Uh, Zari, Zari says, I'm 28 years old. I have a three month emergency fund and any money I get, I invest. I don't buy fancy things and I don't travel for fun. Am I wasting my 20s? Well, so I did exactly what this guy did. I saved, guys, I, I lived at home for like a year or two right after college. Um, actually, I, I, Graduated college, I got a job, and then I moved back after like a year because I just wasn't saving enough money. 
Um, I lived in Huntington Beach and I spent uh, a good amount of money just living. And I didn't make that much. I didn't save very much money the first year. Uh, I moved back in with my parents. Um, I already I had, had a job in that town too. And I saved for like three years straight, two, three years straight, somewhere in that range, two, two and a half years. And I saved everything, guys. I saved everything. Now, I, I will say this. I found great joy in saving. <clears throat> I found peace. I found happiness. I found calmness in, in having a large nest egg is what I'll call it. And that helped me in the beginning saving that. Um, you can call it FU money. You can call it um, huge emergency reserves because you can always tap into your liquid assets. Uh, it did a lot. So I'm one, I'm thankful that my parents let me do that for a little bit. And yes, I covered my own expenses and all that stuff. And I helped them around the house. I changed the oil in their cars, cut the grass. I did all those things. Uh, but it, it really did help me uh, kind of establish a solid footing where I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. So I didn't think I wasted that time frame saving that money. Um, I would have said it would have been a bigger waste of money to go on trips that were very lavish and expensive, but I did go on trips. I didn't just do nothing. I, I played softball, competitive softball. I worked out, I went out with friends, and you can do that on a budget. You don't need to spend a lot of money to do that. There are ways around everything where I didn't feel like I wasted really any of my 20s. I was just doing things that I thought were really fun. Like softball, I, I played pretty competitive softball. Would $2 million be enough to never work again? A couple of years ago, if, if you asked me that five to 10 years ago, I'd say for sure, $2 million is a ton of money. Now I'm questioning like, is $2 million enough? Um, and I think it depends on a lot of people. Uh, I have a family, I support five people total. And that $2 million, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't know if that's enough. Um, I don't know if it'd be comfortably enough. I, I, thought, I would feel like I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it's still a lot of money, not saying that it's not. I just think that depending on what your expenses are, my expenses uh, are probably around sixty to seventy thousand dollars a year is what my current expenses are uh, of everything. So uh, obviously, two million is probably cutting it close. Uh, it's probably in the ballpark of where you need to be. Um, if you, I think you could do the four percent rule, and I think four percent of 20, uh, two million is eighty thousand dollars. So it's probably cutting it real close. Um, and then your expenses go up, and now you're chasing. Do your investments beat your expenses? And, and I don't like that game. I like having a, a room or buffer. So I would say no. It's not enough for me. I, I would like more uh, and have more of a buffer. Adam Koo says Warren Buffett, one of, one of his heroes. I'll perform the S&P 500 by 43 times over the last 58 years. He is the greatest investor that ever lived. Yet, did you know that out of over 210 plus stocks, businesses that he invested in, only 12, less than 5%, made up the majority of his gains. Stocks like Coca-Cola, American Express, Apple, Gillette, Bank of America, and Moody's. He's made lots and lots of bad investments as well, for example. Kraft Heinz, ConocoPhillips, Texco, Dexter Shu, Energy Future Holdings. Um, he lost a, greater than 50% on all of those. To be a successful investor, you do not need to be right on every investment. You just need to be right on a few investments that give you huge gains that more than cover the losing investments, and that's your asymmetry. It is all about portfolio allocation and allowing your winning investments to reach their full potential. A winning investment should multiply your money by 5x, 10x, 20x. A losing investment can only drop you your position size at the most. Many retail investors make the mistake of selling their winners too early and adding more to their losers. And I, I, I completely agree with this. Um, 
a lot of my money. So in 2020, and I didn't realize this was going to be that big of a move, but in 2020, I invested in originally on the March bottom into gold mining stocks. They were actually the very uh, speculative ones, a lot of them, <clears throat> not all of them, but a lot. Um, I had probably, I think I 3X the, the entire portfolio from March to August. Yeah, March to August was a 3X. Then I shifted my money um, because I noticed that oil was just ludicrously priced. And it looked like, in my opinion from history, that money would go and move into the system after they printed all that stimulus. And I was so confident that that was going to occur. So I moved the money from gold and silver mining companies, not all of it, but the majority of it. Um, I kept a little back, which was my starter positions. And I moved it, I would say 90% of it, maybe a little bit less, uh, into oil and gas. Uh, oil and gas in some of those investments, now I didn't win on all of those investments, but some of those investments went up over 10X. Uh, some of them over 30x. And I think I had a handful of them do that in a couple year period. That is all it was, was a couple years that it did all that. Um, I ended up from 2020 to the uh, to my portfolio, you could even say today, but I'll just say the por portfolio in 2022 or so, 2023, um, I over 8X'd my entire portfolio from bottom of 2020 uh, to, I'd say, 2022 and a half or 2023, somewhere in there. Eight times. And now we're, we're slowing down. We're going into a slowdown and we're going to start that cycle again uh, where the yield curve uninverts potentially. Uh, maybe not, but potentially. Uh, we get a slowdown and then they print uh, they do QE, they print more money, they do all that stuff. And <clears throat> doing that stuff is going to rotate money back into other investments here. So this is completely right. And I didn't win on every single one of my investments. There was like probably eight or nine of them that I just absolutely blew the doors off of uh, over 10x in a few years. And they're still going to this day. Uh, JC Parrott says, look at the massive base in small caps. I got people telling me that the market is parabolic and that this is unsustainable. But then I see so many charts that look like this, where things are just getting started. Um, I think he's right. I see a lot of patterns like this, and that's that pattern before a big move. Uh, we saw that in silver recently, and gold had it too back in 2022, 23. Um, there are a lot of charts that look like this, that look like they're ready to just rip. Now, when I look across the board and I look at all of these stocks, I ask myself, you know, maybe they are going to print obscene amounts of money and it's just going to push everything higher. And that very well could be the case. We, we could slow down. There could be a slowdown in the market and the money printing that they are doing is just going to overpower everything. And that very well could be the case where certain assets lose purchasing power against other assets, but they still go up nominally, where the, the dollar value goes up, but they don't go up as fast as some of the maybe undervalued assets that are about to uh, emerge as leaders. Uh, here, like here, this is what I think is going to be a leader of gold. Um, G O L D. We can now look back to see which was the correct answer. The most probable outcome is the one that played out. So what we had here is a breakout, and a lot of the times we get pullbacks or back tests, but not necessarily everything. You know, it, it doesn't happen all the time, is what I should say. So sometimes you get these pullbacks, sometimes they break out, and they just keep running. Uh, and, and you don't know that with certainty. So a lot of people, what they do is they wait for the breakout and they're like, oh, I'll buy the back test. And then it never back tests. So what do you do now? So you want to develop strategies to capture all of this. Um, if you're conservative, you buy the breakout. If you're aggressive, you buy it down here. And then you wait 
for it to break. This, you re you're relying on different things here. The breakout, you're relying on technical analysis and the herd breaking out of psychological barriers. Buying down here and cost averaging in over here might be a strategy where you're like, you know what, the yield curve's inverted and it's going to invert and the market's going to front run that inversion. So I'll buy it when it's down and nobody's really looking at it. And then up here, people are going to be looking at it, at least a lot more people. So that's how you get those entry points is you're looking at the market conditions and what the herd is being subjected to. Uh, and then the chart pattern is what the herd creates later. That's how you get in really early. Bid 61 says, probably true when you consider the amount of diesel needed to extract the materials from the ground, from mines that don't even exist yet. And this is what I said in 2023. I said, what if the best EV play is oil? When everyone finds out it doesn't work and we need more oil. Or we don't have the minerals, but they still have to mine all the minerals and all the diesel needed to do all that. That's correct. Um, I'm not going to read that to you. Skip that. There's a lot there. He goes, so is college worth it? And I don't know if this is a fair comparison, but I wanted to talk about it. It says the median net worth of an American with no high school diploma is $38,000. The median net worth of an American with a high school diploma is $107,000. The median net worth of an American with some college is $137,000. The median net worth of an American with a college degree is 465,000. Now, is that attributed to the accolades of these, you know, high school diploma, some college and college degree? I don't know. Um, what, what, you're, what you're measuring here to some degree isn't that they've got a degree. Uh, you're probably also measuring the IQ of the individual. And IQ has a high correlation to, the, to their net worth and income. So smarter people make smarter decisions with their money. It's kind of like, duh. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet that smarter people on average have more college degrees. And you're kind of like, well, yeah. So I don't know how you can differentiate necessarily a smarter person without a college degree uh, versus a smarter person with a college degree. And then you measure that up. Um, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg has a college degree. I don't think Bill Gates has one. I don't think Michael Dell went all the way through, and those were all very smart people. Um, they're all billionaires. So what matters more? Is it the college degree or is it how smart that person is? Um, I would tend to go with how smart the person is, uh, but I'm sure a college degree, if you're going to work for a nine to five, probably matters to the hiring company. John Johnson says, I'm not sure why Americans struggle to wrap their heads around this one. All right. The American economic system is a Ponzi scheme. It requires new people <clears throat> and more and more consumption to continue to see GDP growth. It does. It needs a larger demographic. Look at sectors like real estate, single family especially, built around growth of population. Many states in the USA already have Jap Japanese demographics with growth of 75 plus age demo rapidly outpacing growth of less than four. So America's already domestically well below the replacement rate. I expect this trend to continue for decades to come. There are many reasons for this or for why this is occurring. Cost of living here, women fully in workforce as percent of labor, blah, 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 blah. But the reasons are usually quite obvious. You either import mass number of migrants, your estimate was low, Adam, or your entire system doesn't work. Hence why Japan has had no GDP growth for 30 years, inflation adjusted and in dollar very negative. Germany and Eurozone following the same course, Canada got lucky with their population was so small they could make a difference. I think the likely policy response to this cycle will hinder more people wanting to come unless they enable UBI. The US is simply too expensive for most from global south, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The the thing to get at here is demographics is what drives a lot of this. In our demographics and a lot of demographics around the world, China, Europe, USA is kind of turning into it. It's not too bad in the United States, but uh, Japan, 
we've got shrinking populations in some of these areas. And that is where your house prices decline. They don't go up anymore. Uh, your growth doesn't go up because you're not selling to more people, you're selling to less people. Uh, things change and shift. And the way that our currency system is set up in our, in our economic growth, I don't know how that's going to work. We could see some struggles because the system is designed for growth. And if you don't have growth, I don't know how it's going to be sustained, is what I'll say. Uh, here's another one. Remember when real estate was supposed to bring down the entire stock market? Turns out it was the opposite of that. Here's real estate coming back up. This is one thing I'm looking at. If real estate goes up with interest rates coming down, we are probably not going to have a huge recession or slowdown. Um, it will definitely be dampened by that because a lot of employment is from the construction cycle. And if we go up in real estate, <clears throat> you, you'll probably see the construction unemployment stay very low. And instruct, construction employment stay very high. Michael J. Kramer says, the number of unemployed people has increased by 21% year over year. It is a high number historically, uh, is what they're saying there. But that's a percent increase. I don't know what the total level is. Um, this is a percent increase year over year. Um, U.S. counties with a life expect expectancy above 80 years old. Um, and there's another thing you want to look at here. Um, these are probably rich areas uh, of these uh, states. <clears throat> And these are also high IQ areas. Um, high IQ areas, uh, they, they found a correlation with high IQ and uh, longevity of life. Uh, but that doesn't seem very, it seems obvious to me. Um, IQ, I'm not say, stating that higher IQs are everything, but generally, in general, uh, smarter people make better decisions. And that goes across the board for also lifestyle choices. So smarter people are going to make better lifestyle choices. They generally make more money uh, and they generally live longer lives. And this is the data to support that. And you can look at an IQ chart of the United States and high IQs are in this section here. It's in the middle here. <laughs> and, I, and these are probably richer areas all throughout the South. Observable crude oil inventories by location. So this is declining a good amount. And we are at low levels going back all the way to 2020 in the previous years. Um, we are for floating storage, way down there for that. Uh, crude oil on water, uh, pretty low. I would say it's, it's almost at five-year lows, uh, depending on where we go from here. And then oil in transit, that's a little bit on the higher side compared to previous years. Mike Zaccardi says the rise in the unemployment rate is not driven by people getting fired, says Torsten. So this is record low level of layoffs is what he's got there. So that is interesting if people are choosing to leave versus being laid off. Um, so that is something to consider. Bobby says, ask yourself, what would a central bank rather own? Uh, well, he's got a cup and handle here. That's not technically a cup and handle. Um, you don't use it as a bottoming pattern, but uh, usually you, you get one that's like a cup and then a handle here, which is continuation pattern. Uh, but gold to treasury ratio, ratio is increasing where people are preferring gold. Um, here's the British pound breaking out against the US dollar to the upside. Um, one thing to notice <clears throat> is that the dollar drops during some of these commodity bull markets. It's the dollar dropping, and then the commodity can stay what the commodity is. During those events where the dollar drops, you'll see emerging markets, Great, Great Britain pound here breaking out. You'll start to see all these currencies break out. The Australian dollar, Brazilian real, Canadian dollar, like all of those will start breaking against the US dollar. Uh, this is one that is breaking out of a falling wedge. This is just the beginning. Uh, this will also lead to a gigantic commodity bull market. 
Uh, it also leads to money rotating out of dollar denominated assets, searching stronger currencies. So that very well could be underway here uh, and it's just starting, which I think is great for commodities. And um, that's what we've got for today. So we'll end it there. Uh, give me a thumb up for the content, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website. You can jump on the Platinum question and answer call. Uh, that's going to be coming out uh, 5 p.m. Um, 5 p.m. Uh, Sunday. So this is being released Sunday. So Sunday, 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, so if you want to join that, go ahead, join the uh, website. You can get a discount May Day, M-A-Y-D-A-Y, if you want to try it out. Jump on the call, see what's going on. Uh, and then I'll be sharing my opinions there and what I'm doing uh, for this bull market. So that's what I've got for today. We'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.